Welcome everybody to this week's uh, lecture in cognitive psychology. It's the second lecture on language and this week we will speak about theories of speech recognition. I would like to start this lecture with a brief video clip on the McGurk effect. Many of you may know that already but we will need that in the first part of this lecture so let's have a quick recap or a first demonstration and uh, I can really recommend when you see in a moment the speaker in the two videos next to each other to switch back and forth between them and listen to what you actually perceive. Many of us have become quick to catch illusions that trick our eyes, but how often do you consider illusions of the ear? Are you really able to trust your ears and the things they hear? For example, listen to Greg speaking. Bar, 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 bar. What do you hear? If you heard bar, 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 you'd be right. But how about now? Bar, 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 bar. Chances are you heard far, far, far this time with an F. Except you didn't. In fact, the audio didn't even change between the two videos. Bar, bar, bar. Strange as it may seem, what you hear depends on which video you're looking at. Go ahead, take turns watching each video and see how the sound morphs. Bar, bar, bar. This is a perfect example of something called the McGurk effect, bar, which shows how our visuals can alter what we believe we're hearing. Now I want you to count how many times you see a circle fly. Okay, if you want to do that again, uh, just rewind, jump a little bit back in this video. We'll continue now in this lecture. <clears throat> Okay, let's have a look at a couple of theories of speech recognition. And first of all, it's important to note that speech recognition is really a complex process, which hopefully um, has become clear after last lecture as well. So uh, I just saw myself not being in focus. So we have seen uh, that the syntax, for instance, can have an effect on the semantics or the meaning of the word and the statements we are listening to. Um, we've seen that in the, as an example in the phonemic restoration effect that there are strong top-down influences on what we perceive and uh, speech perception seems to be a really strong multimodal process like in the McGurk effect where we have, which we just have seen. So um, of course the auditory input is sufficient for a speech processing, but the visual input seems to be not purely supportive, but may actually be totally influence what we hear. So actually change the percept of or the interpretation of the auditory input we are receiving. And in this lecture, we will discuss three theories. The first one is the motor theory of speech perception. This will be part one. Then we will discuss the cohort theory and the trace model. And both of them will be in part two of that lecture. And then in part three, we discuss the syntactical parsing. Okay, let's have a look at the motor theory of speech perception. And this was proposed by Alvin Lieberman in the late 1960s. And the idea is the following. It is that we perceive speech not by uh, just analyzing the auditory input and trying to understand that, but instead that we try, when we hear something, we try to mimic with our own motor track what um, the speaker has produced. So it's like a covert rehearsal, covert re-speaking of what we hear without overt speaking and then our motor system, okay, to produce that sound I have to do these movements in my vocal tract so it must have been that phoneme. That's the idea of how it works. <clears throat> so, in other words, the motor system is involved in both the production of speech and the perception of speech. What is there as support? So, first of all, it's the McGurk effect. Because we have seen that it's not only the auditory input, but also the visual input, which affects uh, our perception. So 
the visual input, when we rephrase that, is information about how the sound is made, how the sound is produced in our vocal tract, the shape of the lips, you know, the example of bar and far. That information uh, affects the sound we hear. So um, this seems to be indeed used somehow to interpret. Another support for the theory is a finding which is called categorical perception. What does that mean? And if you remember last week, we said we have different phonemes as the smallest units of uh, sound which bring about a change of meaning or a distinguishing meaning. And an example is, for instance, da and ta. And um, these phonemes can be uh, classified or defined by the place and manner of articulation. If you remember, the place of articulation was where in the vocal tract is the flow, airflow obstructed, and the manner of articulation is how it is obstructed. So it can be quite nicely defined by these two parameters. And um, now what we can do is we can use uh, a computer software, a speech synthesizer, and now we can gradually morph the acoustics from a da towards a ta. So that we have in between stages acoustically. However, what happens now is that the perception is categorical. That means that we always hear either a clear da or after a certain point of morphing we hear a clear ta. Or in the between stage we may hear sometimes for the same acoustic a da or a ta. But we never perceive something in between, some mixture sound or something like that. And the interpretation of that is that our we can only produce da or ta. Our motor system cannot produce these in-between stages, and therefore what we hear is either ma is mapped either on our da production system or on our ta production system, and we classify and categorize it. And because we can only produce one of the other, one or the other, we only perceive one or the other. This is a graphical illustration, and let's. Uh, go through this graph a little bit slower. So at the bottom panel you see these spectrograms as we spoke about in last week's lecture in language 1. So we have uh, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is frequency, so lower frequencies and higher frequencies, and then we have these energy bands. The, the redder and darker the more energy in that frequency band. And then we have these so-called formants which define the sounds, in particular the vowels as well. Um, and so in this example we can start out with one sound, let's say uh, a bar, and then we can transform that to a da. So you see this is the bar sound and this is the da sound. And the A vowel is the same, but in the beginning we have these differences in between Ba and Da. And we see how we gradually morph from this to this state uh, with these in-between stages. Now what happens with the uh, categorical perception is we always hear a clear Ba, Ba, Ba. Then we have a transitional stage where we either hear Ba or Da, and then we always hear a Da. And then you can do the same for a third uh, word like ga for a third phoneme. So um, this shows that such fine-grained um, manipulations, which we usually are quite good at at perceiving, if you think about music or or other things, we can we can pick up very very small detailed differences in the acoustical signal. But in the case of speech, it seems to be really categorized. So either this or that. There's further support for the theory of the motor theory of speech perception and that comes from the area of, of cognitive neuroscience. And um, from two lines of research, one is functional magnetic resonance imaging and when participants 
go into such a brain imaging scanner, then and, and, and they just listen to speech without the need to produce a speech, so just a passive listening task, we can see that it activates cortical motor areas. Just for clarification, this image is just for illustration and this activation is actually um, acoustic perception. This is not motor area. Motor area would be here. So, <clears throat> so this is one line of research. And the other one is that when we use TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which uses strong magnetic pulses to briefly uh, interrupt the, the proper function or processing in the brain areas, and we use that over the premotor cortex, so a motor area, then this actually impairs the perception of speech. So when we disrupt motor cortices or, or motor areas, we impair speech perception. This is strong evidence for the motor theory of speech perception, that it at least plays, that the motor areas at least play a role in speech perception. Um, a very close link are the mirror neurons. And many of you will have heard of them. What is noteworthy is that the motor theory of speech perception was proposed in the late 1960s, and the mirror neurons were first observed and reported in the early 1990s. So Lieberman's idea was a good 10 years before um, the discovery of mirror neurons. However, the mirror neurons very nicely um, support the idea of the motor theory of speech perception. Therefore, let's have a very quick recap and look at those, at this concept. And mirror neurons can mainly be found in the premotor cortex of monkeys. And their characteristic is that they fire, so they are active when the monkey acts, does, does performs an action, but they also fire when the monkey sees another person performing that particular action. So they are thought to be involved in understanding motor acts of other people. And we could consider language to be a motor act of other people as well. So this as an illustration, so we have the activity of a certain neuron and when this monkey grasps something and puts it into the bowl, then this neuron is active. Now the mirror neurons have the feature that they will also be active when the monkey observes another person acting in the same way, do doing the same action. Okay. However, as always, there is criticism of the theory, or there are problems with observations which are hard to explain and interpret. One thing is that, uh, as we've discussed last week, speech production is highly variable. We have said there are at least 50 different ways to say the word the in, in the English language, with accents and, and things like that. We may have new words we've never heard. So what sound is actually produced by us? When you hear something, how can we make sure that the correct phoneme is produced? The same phoneme as produced by the sender, by the speaker. Because of these transmission errors, of accents and everything, we may actually produce something different in our brain. Um, another problem is that infants are, are really good at listening already, so at speech perception, but they can't speak yet, or only babble or so, so they're not good at speech production. So there seems to be, at least in childhood, infancy, um, a decoupling of perception and production, so that perception is possible without the production. So the, at least the learning of speech must be based on different mechanisms. And we have these clear influences of top-down effects, as we discussed before, like the phonemic restoration effect, which really works on the level of phonemes, so very low level, but still it's highly influenced. Um, so 
we can say that meaning or the context of the LASA meshes, uh, message affects understanding. However, more motor cortices themselves do not code meaning. They are really about movement, action, and things like that. So when we want to summarize the motor theory, um, it has been revised several times to to be to account for these problems, but certain problems still remain, and so it's still debated, in a sense. And um, I think what we can say is that um, the motor theory has some remit, and the motor cortices seem to play a role, but it is unclear how strong this role is, how necessary is the information really to uh, for speech perception. Okay, um, if you have any questions, as usual, please post them in the BBL discussion board and hopefully see you soon for the next part. Thanks for listening.